For Prima Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is award-winning former business journalist Pagamizan Zamela, here to unpack his book titled Native Merchants, The Building of Black Business Class in South Africa. You challenge the notion that claims that Black economic empowerment and government tenders are the only means through which Black people could start and run businesses. So can you tell us more about the research involved in putting this book together and also the inspiration behind the book? It's been close to eight years, right, when I, since I started the project, researching native merchants, going to libraries, archives across the country, trying to unearth the genesis of black business. You know, one of the insults in South Africa, especially post-1994, is that black people were only able to do business only through black economic empowerment. There's nothing wrong with that because black people were deprived of opportunities and that's what B is trying to do to redress that if it is genuine. But in the research, you know, I wanted to go way deeper than broad-based Black economic empowerment entrepreneurs. I wanted to take a gap and do something that has never been done before. Try and dig deeper, dig deeper than apartheid, deeper than colonialism, maybe even pre-colonialism. And that's how the book starts. It was an inspiration to dig deeper on the genesis of Black business people in South Africa. And you write that by the fifth century, Black people in Southern Africa had demonstrated the skills to sink a shaft and excavate base and precious metals. Can you tell us more on this? Sure. So in the book, I go back into the pre-colonial era. I look at a number of provinces, what we call provinces now, blessed with minerals, um, what they would call in the Nguni language is Izambiwa. You know, I go to the north in what is now called Limpopo province. The Lembe and the Venda people were mining, mining copper, you know, regardless of gender and age. They dug up minerals, sank shafts using cowhide, leather trunks, you know, they had technology and they would dig deep. Actually, back in those days, if you were not participating in mining as a black person, you were not taken seriously if your job was to just hold the land and, and participate in, in agricultural activities. In Mapungube, our people, black people, did mine and those minerals were exported into Kilwa, which was a big port in East Africa. And those minerals made their way from what is now called South Africa into Asia and found market in the hands of, of the Chinese. So I write about the pre-colonial era, which I've just mentioned, areas such as Musina, um, of course, the Botswana too did participate in mining. You know, I write about the Barolo, now the Barolo of Munchiwa, Nebarola Tsipi, though it's melt, you know, Morola um, Tsipi Kasetswana means melting. After that, in the colonial era, the big era in South Africa, and excuse the pun, that transitioned the country from, call it an, uh, an agriculturally capital-based country into a mineral-driven industrial country was the discovery of diamond. Now you've got to ask yourself what were black people doing when people bought tickets from England, from America, rushing into Kimberley to mine diamonds. Well, Black people did participate. They did wake up. They did carry picks. They did feel the heat of the sweltering sun. They did dig diamonds. They did find them. They did sell them on their own account. Some of these precious stones discovered by Black people actually made their ways to London in the market. But what happens 
Of course, the racial chauvinism of the people back then who could not compete with black people, they then drew up racial laws to try and stop black people from getting mining licenses. And this is what happened. Now, black people, when they're excluded from mining, what do they do? Do they give up? No, they move into other sectors. They continue to participate in farming. They continue to participate in the transport sector. So if you talk about transport and agriculture, they had cows and they used those cows with wagons and the transport agricultural produce into the buzzing mining town of Kimberley. If you think about the DDT Jababus, in the late 1800s already, they had started newspapers. Their own newspapers, by the way, they didn't buy into existing newspapers, not that it, it, it matters. Um, but they built up printing works from scratch. It was not just the Jababu, there were the guys at Izwilabandu, your anyways, your WD Sogas. You know, they built up Izwilabandu again, um, raising their own money and, of course, cooperating with some liberals. In Betwana, you had people like Sol Plaki, um, working with moguls there to build a newspaper, Korante Abajwana. You can name the industries. I mentioned hoteliers, Tabi, in the 1800s. Black people who invested their own money. You know, there's a man called Clinton who invested 2,000 pounds in 1890s money, building his own hotel that was described to be fit for a black man and a European man. And you also examine the historical disunity among black business associations, a factor that still persists to this day. So can you unpack for us this disunity? Sure. I mean, with any business, there's going to be friends and enemies. The fact that Israel Abantu started, you know, on the back of Imvo Zabantzundu, was on its own a sign of some breakdown of, of, of relations. This is not something that is unique to Black people. It, it, it happens non-racially when partners do not see eye to eye in terms of strategy. But the most pronounced aspect of it in the book is the unity where Black people raised money together to build their own companies. There are stories of people such as Mueli Skoda who had thought of syndicates, floating companies way back in the early 1900s, crowdfunding money. You know, there are the stories of AWG Champion and Msimang, going out into the villages in KwaZulu, raising money to start a Black-owned financial institution. Please explain to us why today there is not a single Black-owned business with a hundred-year history. It's, it's, it's quite scary, right? Um, I don't want to say there is none because I have not found it in the archives, you know. I am hopeful that, you know, with my continuous research, I would find a Black-owned business that is as old as 100 years. I mean, there are institutions, Black-run institutions, or an institution that is over 100 years, and that is the African National Congress, of course. But there are a number of factors, um, Tabi, that made it difficult to find businesses that are as old as 100 years and black managed, black old. What were the reasons? So we've got to understand the context into which black business people operated over 100 years ago. They had limitations. So think about 
the black people who are enterprising enough to try and dig diamonds in their own account and sell them. Those people were stopped by a bunch of racists who did not want to compete. So you've got racism mm -hmm. at the core. I mean, if you think about the free state, many people wanted to start businesses there, but the racist municipalities, they found the free state to be a dormitory for black people, right? They were there to just sleep, wake up and go to, to, to work as laborers. So there were racial laws that prohibited black people from running businesses efficiently. And of course, we must concede that some of the businesses ran into management problems. This is a factor that is non-racial. Businesses rise and fall. So some of the businesses did suffer from a level of poor management. We, we, we must concede that. Some of the businesses also did suffer from poor succession planning. But I must say, you know, in the main, the racist laws and the racist red tape really prohibited black people from owning businesses, you know, that are 100 years old today. You should remember, Tabi, that the politics, you know, the struggle for freedom also diverted people, black people, from running and building those businesses. In the book, I talk about Elias Muretzele, who owned Bantu House, a great restaurant in downtown Johannesburg. Now, Elias Muretzele was a treason trial accused in the 1950s. He had to balance between running his restaurant and attending a court matter as an accused, you know, because that's what racists wanted him to do. There's a Mama Betha Nkize in Kize, and you know, who ran a successful tailoring business in, in Devon city center, you know, up until the racist bullies said, well, black people are not allowed in the market and, 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 and they were moved, you know, group areas act and, 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 and. And lastly, what do you hope people take away after reading your book? I think, you know, the idea, you know, in journalism, they always ask, what is the, so what? You know, so what if people owned brand businesses in the 1800s? The first thing to achieve was to first excavate these stories because they are unknown. We were not taught about these things um, at school. Basic education and higher education. So the first target was to bring out the stories so that they are made public, so that we don't have people with inferior or superior complex, that black people only started doing businesses in 1994, right? That was the first start. The second thing was to say, guys, there are lessons. Let's pick up the lessons of cooperation in raising money to build businesses. The book was inspired by inspiring people, debunking myths that people, black people did not do businesses, but also sharing lessons, especially around succession planning type. That was Pagamisa and Zemela speaking to Kumu Media's quality about native merchants, the building of black business class in South Africa.